Hey everybody, this is Ian. Today we're talking about Sheila Box uh, hashtag Latinx grad caps, cultural citizenship, and the American dream. Um, graduations are a really interesting thing to study in custom because on one hand they are clearly a calendar custom because the world the culture is oriented around them. There, that happens in what May for universities and June for high schools, and because of the orientation, because of the uh, because of the way that the school year is organized, they go in cohorts. And every year, you know that there's a graduating class, and you can sort of see that in small towns where they will put out their congratulations graduates um, signage. Uh, you can see that in um, greeting card stores where they have graduation stuff available. One of the ways I like distinguishing a uh, rite of passage from calendar custom is thinking about like greeting card stores and what, what they have, like a Hallmark store or whatever, and what stock they have at any given moment. And rites of passage, they typically always have those. There's always stuff for funerals and weddings and uh, childbirth and bar mitzvahs and communions and all those sorts of things because those happen along the life of the individual not calendrically whereas there are other things like valentine's day and christmas and uh, um, halloween that are you know the stock you know it's there for a particular time of the year and then it goes because there's not much point in having it kicking around when it's not going to be purchased and graduation fits in there the the graduation stuff you know starts showing up in around march or april and you get those little owls with the with the mortar boards on them and you can start giving them to graduates so they're calendar customs but they are also of course rites of passage they're also individually they are there's a rite of passage that's celebrated as a cohort and they become a very peculiar thing if you think about them, particularly when we, when we think about the ceremony themselves, because you are forced into this cohort aspect through dress. Uh, we don't always talk about costume too much in contemporary rites of passage and contemporary, um, contemporary uh, calendar customs because it doesn't happen too often in North America. I mean, you can make certainly make arguments for the wedding dress uh, and so on, but the wedding dress is a anticipated uh, piece of costuming that uh, nevertheless is about the individual. Whereas for the, for the graduation, everyone is meant to wear the robe. Whatever you are wearing, you throw this robe over your head and, some, and you'll have the hood and the hood might distinguish you uh, from other degree programs, but puts you into a cohort. So like there's the Bachelor of Arts hood and the Bachelor of Education hood and so on. And then uh, in the United States, it doesn't happen as much in Canada, but there, then there's the mortar board, which is you know, a plain black hat. So basically you are being branded as not an individual person, but a graduand, you know, that weird term for someone who has fulfilled everything to qualify for graduation and yet has um, has yet to be bestowed the actual accreditation and then you cross this cross the stage one by one usually although now the mega university often has it where people stand up and like congratulate uh, you know the whole class stands up congratulations you've all graduated and then they sit down again because they just don't have the time and that's a consequence of the mega university but you know so but in a smaller one you cross the stage one at a time, you you subjugate yourself to the chancellor or whatever, and then you, uh, as you move through space, the classic rite of passage aspect, um, and you are individualized, you are granted that status, and then you have officially transferred from the liminal state of graduand to the, um, you know, incorporated state of graduate. Cool. But it's done through costume. And then you have the mortar board phenomenon, the decorated mortar board that Sheila is talking about. And Sheila, Sheila Bach has been studying these for years, uh, since 2014. And what you have is this really interesting personalization of an otherwise anonymizing piece of costume. Um, because, uh, as I said, everyone is dressed the same. Everyone is meant to be treated uh, um, uh, tr treated more or less identically and now you have this thing where people now take that and personalize it 
Um, and it's no accident it's the mortarboard itself. I mean, why isn't it the robe? Obviously, the mortarboard is the highest thing on the head, so it's the most visible. It's the one that is, um, you know, can be easily seen from behind and so on, so there's a practical element to it. But the fact that it is representative of education itself, it is representative of the achievement to the point where the mortarboard is a signifier of the act of graduation, uh, much more than the robe. Judges wear robes. Other people wear robes. Um, but the mortarboard is this mark of the graduand and becomes the, the cultural touchstone for it. So that is the thing that becomes um, modified. That's the thing that becomes an, an opportunity to take the found object and turn it into a piece of art. You could make arguments about how that's a standard folk art aspect um, in terms of one of the interesting things about yard art in the suburban space is that suburban houses and contemporary row houses, but you know, going back generations, are all the same and all the houses are the same. And so how you decorate the house takes that anonymous, impersonal, mass-produced space and then converts it into a place, converts it into an individual ex form of expression. I went to private school for six years. Don't send your kids there. It's terrible. And we all had to wear uniforms. And we became very, uh, we, we, we weren't allowed decoration on them, but we became very conscious about those little distinctions that could be made in terms of personalization, everything from, and also then, of course, the, the status that is accorded in terms of who actually had, um, you know, who is from the wealthier family. The idea is that, is the, that everyone is more or less rendered the same through the uniform, but you can tell the difference. Even, even you know, 12-year-old Spotty Herberts like myself could tell the difference between like a fine um, Ralph Lauren-like um, white cotton shirt and sort of a, a white cotton shirt from Sears and you could just you could sense it so you could still take that anonymous space that, that anonymizing uh, aspect and personalize it and the mortarboards do that the mortarboards do it I think there's two different things that are happening and one is they direct attention they simply direct attention uh, probably for the idea that they are part of a this, this is the rite of passage. People come, families are coming, and it's like, how will I recognize you in this sea? Well, I'll decorate my mortarboard and you can you can see it. Then they become tools not simply for, for personalization, but for some kind of expression of personalization. So it's not simply a decorative for the idea of drawing attention, but as attention is being drawn, it communicates something. And then you have Instagram. You have the 20, you have social media, where uh, what I think is really fascinating about the article is you have the idea of these mortarboards that then then transcend the space of the uh, the graduation space itself, and they go out and they become um, communicated beyond the confines of the university or beyond the confines of the high school itself. So they move. It isn't simply, I am a member of this class, uh, but I'm a unique member of this class. I, it's now not the class of University of uh, Las Vegas, which is where Sheila is, so that's the, that's the example I'm pulling. But it's not, I'm not simply a graduate of the class, I am a graduate of the year 2020. And then the political aspect comes, and the Latinx caps in specifically, where they're hashtagged and they are, they are individual uh, contributions to this larger, social community that is radically affirming itself as part of um, as part of this uh, um, again using her term which she uses in quotes in part of this American dream so indeed what draws together the diverse individuals who choose to post images of their decorated mortarboards with the Latinx grad caps hashtag is not necessarily shared geographic origins or ethno-national identities but the shared experiences of marginalization and contingent citizenship in the United States and by doing so they are and pledging allegiance to the rest of them by, by, alle by allying themselves with others who are doing the same thing they are suggesting that massive trans-university cohort. So, by being a university graduate, what does the university graduate imply? Well, 
Obviously, it's a skill set. Obviously, it's all the things that have been sort of commended to you uh, or recommended to you when you decide to go to university and all the things that are part of the culture. But one of the things is um, a theme is that it is basically an entry point into an entry point into sort of, you know, being able to exercise one's full citizenship, citizenship in the loaded sense of the word, like you are becoming um, something. You have entered into this new stage. You've entered into this new status that is accorded you. And the tension that exists is how much of that new status, how much of that citizenship is, has historically been defined by, in the American context, in the Canadian context too, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna um, throw stones. Uh, how much has that been defined by participation in whiteness, in Anglo whiteness? And so the Latinx hashtags on the, uh, the Latinx grad caps uh, hashtags have to do with, I am participating, but I am not assimilating. I am part of this, I, I'm the natural extension of and participation in this project that we have collaboratively called the American Dream, the Canadian story, yet simultaneously, I am not going to erase those aspects that don't fit into that template. And they become these political acts. They become these incredibly important, defiant acts. So, as much as the rite of passage is about the individual, it's about the individual shifting in status and being witnessed by the group, being witnessed by the group, being, uh, being uh, confirmed by the group with the idea that the group continues to have constancy, continues to have... Um, a sense of permanence despite the fact that members move through it and members shift in status with this with the uh the, col the calendar custom it's that once a year when we get together and through this particular theme we reaffirm um one of the we, we reaffirm the constancy of the group despite the fact um in in a way it's the the counterbalance to the rite of passage um we reaffirm the constancy of the group despite the fact that we exist in linear time and things change. We can always go back to this, which is why we always go back to these traditional symbols like the form of dress, like the use of pomp and circumstance, like the mortarboard, um, like the, the structure of the ritual. The, 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 the commencement exercises, the graduation exercises are a play, and we redo that play each and every year with different actors. Uh, and you know different elements of it, but it's like a it's like a variety show where you have the monologue, you have the speech, and so on, and it, it is a structure, and there's an, there's an anticipation on how it is meant to be done. But with this disruptive aspect, you have this new cohort, and through the through the hashtag, you have the creation of a cohort that is not defined by the university itself, by graduates of UNLV or graduates of any university, but rather this graduating class of Latinx. And particularly, even though it's the Latinx term is used, and Latinx, she, she, as she explains in a footnote, Latinx can be a problematic term because it seems to emerge from a middle class um, Latin, I now have to use the adjective to explain it, a, a middle class academic uh, Latinx community that wants to transcend the Latino, Latina gender binary and sort of you know shift beyond that and yet that's a term that doesn't really work in non-english language speaking communities so all of a sudden you're using an invented term to describe a people and it's a little bit uh so um but anyway i'll continue to use latinx knowing that there, there could be a problem with it uh, but particularly most of the caps in fact i think all of the caps that sheila talks about um are are women's caps and so it is about this doubly, perhaps triply stigmatized identity. The stigmatization of um, women in a uh, predominantly misogynist patriarchal society. The stigmatization of, um, of uh, the, the non-white 
in a white supremacist society, and particularly within the Latin community, the stigmatization of um, citizenship, whether we are talking about people who have who are documented or not, the notion, the, the ongoing political problematization that they have to face and they continually have to address on whether their citizenship is legitimate, whether or not their citizenship is legitimate uh, in terms of having been gone through a documentation process or not, They're, they are forced by the virtue of the political rhetoric against them to continually reaffirm their place. Whether their place is, as, is, is through uh, the, you know, the DREAM Act or whether their place is through other forms of, of, of bestowed citizenship. And so you have the idea of participating in this American dream. It's, it's similar to Davalos' work on the quinceanera uh, where it is about the, or the quinceanera, in, at least how it was celebrated in, in Chicago, was about this sort of recognize, uh, recognition that one is about, as one enters into, um, using Davalos' term, Mexicana adulthood, you are going to be faced with a whole host of challenges uh, because of that issue of citizenship, because of that issue of being... Um, in the in the space between um, Mexican in this community and and American, because of being a woman, uh, you are about to face a whole world of liminality. And the quinceanera is like this is a celebration prior to me entering into this liminal stage as I go not into adulthood per se, but towards adulthood. So who is the audience? For these, And obviously there's the people who are immediately present in terms of sitting near them, there's the people who are immediately present in the larger scale of the convocation hall, and then there are the people who are following the hashtag Latinx grad caps. But there are also people who it will be, attention is drawn towards it, and you can tell that there is a message there. It's that one point, um, and she's, uh, she's citing Gonzalez Martin here. Self-conscious forms of self-documentation that simultaneously refuse outsider judgment to validate the process of public self-creation while also benefiting from legibility to outsider gaze to circulate political dissent. So the concept is that I, let's just use myself as a generic non-Latinx person, I see that there is a message Sometimes I can get that message because sometimes they will use English. Sometimes I will not get that message because sometimes they will use Spanish. Sometimes they will hybridize, uh, and Portuguese. Sometimes they will hybridize both of those, uh, both English and either Sp and Spanish or English and Portuguese. They will flip back and forth, demonstrating their biculturalism. Uh, sometimes they will use symbols, some of which I recognize, like American flags or Mexican flags. Some I might not like the use of the butterfly in, in, and its uh, its role in the in the uh, debate about the Dreamers Act and the immigration. Uh, but I know that there is a message taking place. I know that something is being communicated, even if I cannot necessarily fully discern. Uh, sometimes I can because I can articulate things and I, I can I can interpret, and sometimes I can't. But I know that there is a message being being presented. Uh, and the fact that I am kept, that I'm sometimes kept on the outside of that message is a political act in and of itself. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the message is not for me, but rather the message is meant for me and its indecipherability is my problem, not theirs. That's kind of a cool idea. So who, when we are talking about these communications, the communication that is the mortar board, we have these multiple audiences, we have the people that is Im expressly intended for, in terms of I am talking to my fellow XYZ, but I know it is being overheard. And in some ways, 
the idea that is being overheard is as if not more important because that's where the act becomes the political. It isn't simply providing comfort to people who are similar to myself, even though that is one of the things that the rite of passage does and the calendar custom does, is it brings some kind of closure and brings some kind of settled interpretive framework to to the idea of change, um, it, 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 to, and to the idea of status change and the idea of place in society of the individual and the collective. But it's seen by the many. Many of the times when we talk about calendar customs or rites of passage, both, uh, we might be overly pat in our discussion of the group as some kind of unified whole. And we forget that sometimes the group exists within a larger context. And as much as it is reaffirming uh, itself to itself, it's reaffirming itself to others who might be questioning its very right to exist, or at least its very right to uh, enjoy the freedoms of self-expression. So if you think about things like a gay pride parade, is a gay pride parade for the gay community? Yes. Is it for the, the non-gay community and maybe even particularly for the community that is hostile or for, for the people who are hostile to the gay community? Yeah, it is. There are calendar customs that are about defiance, that they are I am here, we are here, we are collectively here and we are through play through art, through art, through symbol, through joyous participation, we are um, reaffirming our persistence through time. We are reaffirming our persistence through time as creative and intelligent and joyful beings. Um, and wh whether you like it or not. Key to this and key to the idea of this as sort of on the threshold of rite of passage and calendar custom is the notion that the individual who might be graduating it's it's such a common theme in the latinx grad caps it's such a common theme that they are uh both on the cap itself perhaps directly um directly indexed by the cap but certainly through the explanatory text of the instagram caption it's often invoked that the contribution, uh, the, 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 their achievement, their shift in status, their uh, movement, um, separation, transition, incorporation from one social category to another social category um, is an achievement, but an achievement that could not have been done without um, the, the family. And so there's this intersection between the individual as part of a family, the family as representative of the immigrant struggle and the immigrant story to begin with. So, so often it is about as I am participating and I have access to this American dream and this and the, the university degree is one of the markers of how I um, of how I have achieved that. And no one can take away the idea that I have participated in this incredibly colonizing thing that is the um, you know, post-secondary education. But I now have this thing, and yet I would not be here were it not for the, uh, the work of others. So it is not, it is an individual, the individual is being marked as having achieved something, but is a standing on the, sh on the shoulders of giants. And so, again, we always go back to that, the relationship between the individual and the group. This becomes an aspect for the individual to, within the context of their particular individualized rite of passage, however much it's celebrated as a cohort and there becomes a calendar custom, but through this individual rite of passage, recognizing the consistency of the group, the achievement of the group as a whole. Uh, the defiance that is part of the Latinx grad cap uh, phenomenon 
is the idea that there is a narrative about the immigrant, and particularly the, the Latinx immigrant, um, that is being perpetuated. I've already sort of spoken about this, but it's being perpetuated in the press in terms of um, all the negative stereotypes that one can have, uh, in, if you are anti-immigrant to begin with, uh, um, that are built in issues of race, built in issues of white supremacy, built in a whole bunch of different uh, concepts, plus the immediate historical aspect of the past 15 years and the fact that immigrants from border uh, border countries are demonized more than immigrants from elsewhere because of the idea that they have historically always been um, seen as potential encroachers. What is a border for if not a fear of the other and it's fear of this particular other? So the other um, is almost going to be demonized by default. Um, but these become a counter narrative. The Latinx is about I am participating in your in your um, project, uh, but I am participating in your project by my rules, uh, and successfully I have achieved what you what you have told me to achieve. I have achieved the, in the manner in which you think achievement takes place. So it's kind of a fascinating read because on one hand it's about material culture and material culture of taking the material culture that is expected of this particular rite of passage, the costume and the mortarboard, the very peculiar American mortarboard, um, and then turning it around into something that is, um, shifts it from being an anonymizing to something that is being, um, to something that is being um, individualized, personalized, and becomes a conveyor of meaning. There are, of course, other mortarboard decorations that are much more jokey. There are ones that are pop culturally oriented that aren't necessarily interested in the issues of defiance, but are nevertheless aspects of expressing a personality when the whole ceremony is about the erasure of, of individual personalities and, and the creation of a class and the creation of a cohort. Uh, but these are particularly, the, the Latinx grad caps are particularly expressive ones. It's a fascinating project. Sheila's larger project, it's available. I'll put a link in the description because um, you know, much, much of it's been ongoingly archived through Ohio State. But, um, but this in particular, how this, again, this weird intersection of calendar custom and rite of passage becomes not simply the celebration of academic achievement, but becomes the celebration of a defiant Latinx achievement. Uh, an achievement that in some ways goes against the odds, not of capability, uh, but of the, the practical limitations that a fractured society place upon or against um, uh, Latinx women's uh, success. And then, but despite this, you know, just to, to shift other other, uh, other marginalized groups, and yet I rise. So that's it. That's Sheila's article. Uh, it is uh, Sheila Box, uh, hashtag Latinx grad caps, cultural citizenship, and the American dream. It's wonderful. I urge you to check it out if you haven't done so already. My name is Ian, and as ever, my friends, I wish you nothing but the best. So be well. Bye-bye.